That's going to be fun all. That, uh, that's going to be fun all week. But anyway, uh, so if I was the chair, oh, okay, there. What, what do I? What do I do to share my to share my? Is one of these buttons up here? I think are the presentations loaded into? Yes. Type. So meeting materials? Yes. Um, actually, no. This is this is good. This oh, is no, good. I think you do the share share screen thing, and then you can share the slides. Yeah. Okay. This is the agenda. Fabulous. And oh, and I'm sharing slides. Okay, great. Um, and I also want to share my screen for now. Let me go. Let me go find it. Oh, I'll just I'll just keep I'll just keep messing with it. You know me. Um, and yes. We are still getting slightly organized. We are most of the way there, but we are not all the way there. Uh, so if anybody would like to come up and uh, it's going to be speaking, come up and uh, make sure that everything is okay for them. That will be great. And I look forward to knowing what the answer is very soon. Okay, I'm getting stupider. Okay, you have slides. Um, okay, so I stupidly, okay, you say stupidly, um, I did the thing where it's like, well, I'm not going to be using my camera or uh, my audio, so I didn't, I didn't authorize those things on the way up. Ah. And the next week, um, Should you maybe uh, step out and step back in? I logged out and logged back in, but I did not restart my browser and stuff. Let, let me let me do that. Well, hold on. Before we start, let's just let's see what. Yeah, see, this is what I'm getting. And it's not it's not it's not refreshing yet. So that's irritating. Yeah. Did you join the regular one or the um, light? Oh, regular. So I think the audio, like it shouldn't be doing audio through the computer because it's some kind of setup. Yeah. So this is the slides, right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So can you go back to the music room thing? Yeah. Um, so if I was doing this and. Okay, this is me. 
Okay. And I say, need a coat. Okay. There, there, there. Yes. Okay, so request for other permission. That's, 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 okay. Hit complete anyway. We're gonna, I think that the audio should be through. Uh, yeah, I just, I just need to be able to turn the video on. Uh, there should be cameras on you right there. But, but I'm saying to share my screen. Right, so, uh, oh, which one? See, I don't see. Back to the share slide. Right. Okay. So, oh, okay, okay, this is, this, is what I, this is what I'm looking for. Okay, excellent, excellent, cool. Uh, okay. Um, my okay, so one more, one more. Uh, let's see. What do we got? I could at least do this, and people could start doing the the sound check. On, on that side. Okay, excellent. This side will show if you, if anybody remote has a video. Okay, cool. Okay. Uh, so that is interesting, and. It was a year. It was a year. It was a year. It was a year. Okay, so we have this. Yes. And um, what I was hoping to do was to um, also share. Quickly, this. So I wanted to show this also, and this is this yeah. is HTML. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. No, uh, really? Yeah, yeah, that's, so that's HTML, uh, and I want to, um, you guys can do this, People, it, it, literally anyone can do this on their own iPad. I want to download this as PDF, yes, which is there. And I want to upload that. Yeah, that, that's where all the other ones came from, yeah. Um, I'm sorry? Oh. I have had a request uh, since we were in a meeting room for people to go ahead and put masks on, which I think includes me. If we would take a moment to do that, that would be great. Okay, so I am there. So then in Medeco. Okay. And so then I would just go, it's not there, but. Um, Are you trying to want to share the thing that you just uploaded? Yeah. And cool. So what do I need to do then? I'm sorry? Highlighted thing, but 
for that. Yeah. And so I'm going to share again. Okay. Uh, I, 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 and we're going to share the agenda. Okay. Uh, if it's not in here, just <laughs> have it up immediately. Yeah. So, and we will make sure so we get there. Yes. Oh, okay, okay, okay. There, um, and that is a log out of <laughs> log out of the data tracker. So from here, just yeah. Through the door here. Oh, okay. Okay. And then you can join again. You are you are amazing as always. <laughs> well, I was trying to get logged in enough to where I could just say meet Echo and make occurs. No, 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 no. I'm still, I'm still getting that. Yeah, that's not a problem. It's, uh, it doesn't uh, find your webcam. Yeah, but yeah, yes, yes, you're right. One of these days, I'm going to have to figure out how to clear that, but it doesn't need to be this week. Um, and so I'm going to go, oh, sorry, there. And there. Oh, okay. Cool. Okay. Oh, and this is actually working better than I think it is because. So, yeah. I'm actually looking. Let's see. Those are chair slides. Okay, I'm guessing that because that was uploaded so very recently, it's not in here yet. So you're gonna we're gonna try something else, okay? Okay. Well, uh, yes. Okay. I'm just so making sure you got that. The little okay. wrench icon. You want to see that one? Yeah. Uh, and then manage slides. Okay. And then you have to do. Uh, the this is where my mind is different from yours. Uh, there should be a thing to upload something manually here. Oh, okay, cool. Okay. Okay. So find the and then we can Okay. Well and I I don't I don't actually either, so that's what I need to that's what I actually need to find. Uh, so yeah. What did I call that? Oh, yeah, oh, there we are. Is this it? No, this is not what I. I anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll figure this out another day. <laughs> Uh, we probably screwed it around before. Yeah, I know. I got to see that. Not this one. But but that can be for different reasons. Uh, yeah. No, I, I think I have two different things that are both called that are both called hair spots. So I I actually need to be able to do something. Let me turn this on. Real smart. Yeah, let's just look at
Um, so I want to I want to start okay I want to start with my slides. And let's make believe that this. Oh, there's the agenda. Okay, that, that did happen. Okay, good. So I'm importing that. Oh, do I need to import all these before I share them? Uh, all, all the way down. You need to close your list window, right? All the way down. Yeah. Okay. So am I? You're doing that. Okay, great. Uh, and so I think we are ready to start uh, triumphing over technology. <laughs> and do you have a? No, I got, and I do not have one. Stuart did, but let's, let's go ahead and let's go ahead and the, the rest of the world will, will thank us for having these. But, <laughs> cool. I, th I think we I think we can roll from there. Thank you. So I apologize for uh, the uh, extended uh, vacation in here, an opportunity to talk with each other. Uh, Let's go ahead and get started. My name is Spencer Dawkins. Mike, Mike, too slow, too low. Louder. Are you guys hearing me now? Yeah. Cool. I, I will eat the mic. <laughs> so um, welcome to Hull RFC. I want to uh, thank Aaron Falk, who is for like the last nine well this is the 10th this is the 10th hot rfc talk uh so uh and he has done all the work on all of it so let's see i should also mention that he's not able to be here with us this time because uh he has COVID. 
So, um, so that, I'm sorry? I'm sorry, uh, yes. I'm sorry that uh, Aaron is not be able, able to be here with this, but like I said, he has done Hot RFC, all the work on it uh, for 10 Hot RFC talks, uh, and we owe him a round of thanks for that. We should applaud. Cool. Um, and oh, right. I really do need to use Meet Echo more often. <laughs> oh, I do. Uh, so the ground rules: Hot RC is a request for conversation. Um, it's a good way to find a way, find people to talk to for various reasons, and we don't actually care what the reasons are. Uh, each person who's going to be speaking uh, gets four minutes from go to please applaud. Um, at four minutes, we start applauding, which looks like this. And the crowd goes wild. So when you're speaking and you if you if you happen to hear people applauding, uh, that is your opportunity to recognize what a great job you have done and pass back the micro microphone to the next speaker. Uh, we don't do questions after each talk here that basically the thing with Hot RFC is that this is where you come and you provide follow up. So basically saying what you want people to do and how you want them to find you to do it. Um, is is part of each talk. Um, to follow along, we're going to be using the data tracker for all slides. So we will let the con the we will let the conversations begin. And um, first speaker we have will be Torless. Uh, who will be talking about what has the IETF ever done for energy? Uh, give me a second to get slides up and to start a clock. And I'm removing the mask because my accent is uh, worse enough already. I hope that's fine. Still louder? Okay. All right. People on the back falling over. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I hope it's okay to remove the mask while I'm uh, here on the microphone because my accent is already bad enough and I don't need uh, a microphone to make it worse. And maybe if we can get the levels up, that would help people to really not eat the mic. Not sure if the technician is still here while Spencer is still working and going, going, going. A deck may be shared with the remote audience, but not the room. <laughs> I would not I would not be a bit surprised. Oh, it's where is your where is your deck? Um when I was going through it I was I was seeing it, I could click on it. You're looking for what what has the IETF ever done with? There, there we go. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. We are sure we are sharing slides. Give me just one second. To start an official timer. Okay, there is going to be an official timer. Okay. On your marks, get set, go. All right, welcome everybody. Um, so we, we started to think about um, what might be interesting to do about uh, energy, uh, green networking, sustainability, and so on. And then you step back and say, well, you know, uh, what is already uh, been done in the IETF? And um, when we started to write this together, it actually went through a lot of different areas. Um, which reminded me of really uh, the uh, Monty Python, the life of Brian, right? So uh, 
what have the Romans ever done for us? And uh, you know, you start with, oh yeah, the ITF, that's just LLN, uh, low power networks, IoT, that's all it's energy related. And uh, when you then go through um, what the ITF done, I think it's a lot more. Um, so the um, purpose of the document is uh, to become maybe an um, <clears throat> uh, individual submission document for um, uh, education of the community and to help, um, you know, steer interest in new work, but also uh, to broaden the adoption of uh, the specific technologies uh, mentioned. Now, um, I'll, I'll just, uh, you know, show you here the um, uh, the content of the document. A lot what I think um, really helps uh, preserve energy from the IETF work is really incidental, meaning all the technologies we've done to some extent um, do save energy compared to their prior non-digitized um, solutions. Um, and uh, then the other part that really made the um, uh, ITF technologies become very energy saving is the, uh, the saving through scale, right? Building the internet, converging all these different uh, separate network applications into one network. So those things are um, uh, big areas in the document. Um, and then um, looking into specific applications like telecollaboration, computing with sustainable energy. So they're, they're really specific areas, I think, of interest. Obviously, I hope I'm missing uh, big areas and people will jump up and say, uh, you know, we can contribute other stuff that incidentally uh, relates to energy saving as well. And then the obvious one, low power, lossy, constrained networks. Uh, we've got, uh, you know, almost an area worth of um, uh, working groups um, that are working uh, on various technologies and then there are some uh, you know sample technologies where you know I just had some background and interest in but hopefully there there'll others uh, be added to it um, and then of course the specific networks being built to actually uh, support the generation of power um, smart grid synchrophaser networks um, that's a totally different approach and then energy management we had an eman working group and later on there were ideas to do uh, power awareness in networks but uh, they didn't uh, pan out so far to form working groups but there are some good initial drafts uh, next slide so yeah um so this document just uh, to repeat if you're interested, please read it, provide feedback. If you're interested to contribute, please contact the authors. Um, uh, it would be great if this could become a community effort uh, of, of the different areas of interest. Um, uh, and maybe there is a strange old mailing list that may, might also be, be used to discuss these things. Sounds like a recipe for possible collaboration. Um, and yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. Excellent. Um, let's see. Our next our next speaker should be um, Alexander. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, and let me get your slides into the right place. And Hello, can you hear me? Great. Am I in the right place? Does it show? Oh, okay, it doesn't show here. Okay, well, okay, so, um, yeah, so, um, uh, welcome everyone. So basically, th this presentation is briefly to build on what Charles was just presented, presenting on challenges and opportunities in green networking. And there are two drafts, actually, which this presentation relates to. Please, next slide. I just have a, oopsie. The, there should be two slides after this. No, no, I mean, they, they are. I'm just getting an unstable connection of the server. Um, let me. Yeah, I just got I just got server unreachable. Let me connect to somebody. Let me connect to another device.
Interesting. My apologies. Okay. Okay, great. Okay, thank you. Yes, so, so, so really, this concern is two drafts: uh, one a problem statement and uh, uh, with challenges and opportunities in green networking, and one basically addressing one, or starting to address one of the challenges, namely the metrics and the instrumentation. Um, next slide, please. Okay. So basically, um, yeah, this builds a little bit also on what uh, Charles was presenting earlier. So the question is, uh, why green networking or why sustainability, actually? And obviously, this is one of uh, mankind's grand challenges. And uh, the question is basically, well, while network applications themselves are key and able, of course, to sustainability, what about the networks themselves? And clearly, the, the net zero mandates, et cetera, will apply to the network providers as well. Sorry, we lost connectivity again. That was odd. How did we get that? <laughs> I am getting so I am getting an unreliable connection to the server after switching to my my uh, phone as a hotspot. So I'm curious. Wait, we seem to we, we seem to be coming back to life here. Okay. All right, so let's go to, let's see uh, maybe three times the charm. <laughs> so, um, okay, so, so uh, anyway, so, so the question is, what it boils down to this is, uh, the question is also, how can, how do, can the network uh, itself um, uh, contribute to that? And how, what are ways in which the IETF and the network, at the networking level, uh, how we can uh, contribute to making networks more sustainable um, and this may perhaps be a smaller factor than general hardware advances and deployment factors and antenna technology, but still, of course, there are certain things which are within our con uh, control. Next one, next slide, please. Okay, and so there are um, quite a few opportunities and, of course, challenges associated with them. Uh, we divided them into 
four different uh, yeah into four different levels basically one for one basically going bottom up uh, at the device or at the equipment level it starts with providing proper instrumentation and visibility into the right types of metrics um, uh, which because uh, unless you have visibility to this uh, all the other well then basically it's kind of like future what, what else you are uh, attempting to, to do and this is kind of like our starting point there but of course it shouldn't uh, end there there are things that you could do at the protocol level and basically a wide, wide range of things, uh, anything from basic traffic ad adaptation to lead to traffic characteristics, which are more energy friend, uh, friendly, if you will, to um, uh, enabling other mechanisms, such as, for instance, uh, fast discovery, fast state reconversions, if you, for instance, uh, dy dynamically uh, take uh, resources in and out of service, for instance, um, um, uh, network addressing to have smaller tables to maintain, et cetera. Uh, et cetera. At the network level, there is the question of can we do more energy aware routing uh, path configuration that takes energy and sustainability into account? What would be some of the control protocol extension that would make sense there? And then finally, basically also at the architecture level, one can look at some of those things uh, as well, basically. For instance, when it comes to where do we place content, where do we place computation? Of course, people are already looking into this, but not so much with the energy or sustainability in the foreground, but there's certainly an aspect that, that plays a role there as well. And so there are many pieces and support that can contribute to this. Not one grand solution is required. Um, next, next slide, please. And uh, so basically, we want to yeah, generate basically more uh, discussion on this. And so we have posted two drafts on this topic and would appreciate uh, feedback, comments on this. So there's a problem statement, and then basically metrics is the first specific work item. Um, and uh, we are also still looking for collaborators uh, and actually the proper landing spot here in, here in the ITF. Um, uh, between the authors, we will have an informal site meeting on Tuesday uh, from 1 to 2 in Salon 9. If you are interested in joining or in contributing, please please join this meeting. And uh, anything else, you, are, you have our contact information on the slides. That's all. Thank you. So uh, we have uh, next speaker is uh, Sophia. Oh, yes. Hi, Spencer. I'm online, though. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> let, let me let me let me uh, let me get back here and get organized, and I will I will okay. uh, share your slides. There you go. Okay, Sophia? Yes, uh, should I go? <laughs> yes, please, please, please start. I am starting your clock. Okay, thank you. So, hi, everyone. Uh, so, today I wanted to talk about the challenges and opportunity of post quantum cryptography for network set protocol. Uh, next slide, please. My name is Sophia Sell. Next slide, please. <laughs> So basically, why should we talk about this? So as many of you might, might have heard, NIST uh, ran a process to actually select new post-quantum algorithms, mainly algorithms that are safe in the, in the face of the threat of quantum computers. And right now, this process have actually reached its first milestone, actually this month, and they decided to actually announce the selected algorithms that are going to be standardized for the key exchange process, meaning that that's the process in which you generate a key and you also share that key with a participant to arrive to arrive to confidentiality and also this they decided to standardize the algorithms for authentication mainly digital signatures this is just the first milestone they're going to run the next competition for more digital signatures and also for a fourth run but they indeed reached the first milestone meaning soon we were going to be having a standardized post quantum algorithms from the uh, basically from the NIST institution next slide please 
So why is this important for the ITF? Because one of the things that one might think is to just take the post-quantum algorithm, the signature algorithm, for example, and swap it uh, in the place where a classic algorithm might have been. But this is not so simple because all of the post-quantum algorithms, in, in specific the signature algorithms, have bigger uh, parameter sizes when compared with the classical counterparts. And here I just put a simple um, list uh, actually compare with some classical algorithms. And when they actually are not bigger in size, uh, they do have also bigger computational times in their signing or verification times. Next slide, please. Okay, so as I said, that's already a trade-off because you will have bigger sizes, you will have bigger computational times, and that in turn means that maybe we will be adding latency um, or increase, uh, increased times to the connections that we have, which means that the network and protocols that we're using are going to be affected. And also an important point is that right now, the majority of protocols that we use being uh, TLS or Warga or Signal are mainly addicted to Diffie-Hellman properties, and the majority of us quantum algorithms don't have all of the Diffie-Hellman properties that we love. And also certain algorithms that are now currently being standardized by the IETF, for example, in the PPM group, don't really have a post-quantum counterpart that, that can be attested for a high security, just like, for example, zero knowledge proofs or OPRFs so or threshold signatures do have post-quantum uh, alternatives, but they have not been properly assessed for their security. Next slide, please. Okay, maybe. Oh, there you go. Okay, thank you. Um, well, this is very important. As I said, it's uh, something that we should start thinking about experimentation to see how much we can indeed add these post quantum algorithms, or if we cannot add it, what kind of alternatives do we have? And this in turn means that maybe we should build designs that are generic for post quantum algorithms, but also for other things. And this also in turn means that maybe the way uh, that the protocols right now are working could potentially be changed to not only include post quantum algorithms, but also other uh, things that are needed. If you're ever interested, interested, we're running a workshop on this specific challenge of putting post quantum cryptography in network and protocols. It is going to be potentially co located with the NIST workshop on uh, November. So please reach out if you're interested in participating to it. And there's also currently a new ITF, mainly list PQC, that you can join and continue the discussion. Next slide. And with that, thank you very much. So next person on the agenda is, I believe, Pascal. Okay. So we go. Uh, go. Go. Uh, so this talk is about Internet of Secure Element and the call to research and collaboration. Uh, next slide, please. So to introduce the issue to learn about secure elements, a small chip using bank card, SIM module, electronic passport, uh, with uh, height uh, security level, height uh, security level in the market. There are today many eight uh, small 8 to 16 CPU with 10 kilobytes RAM and uh, 100 uh, kilobytes of non-volatile memory. There's new generation with about uh, 2 megabyte flash and 64 kilobytes SRAM, and they include a crypto processor. They use a legacy communication which is based on serial and ISO 7816 protocol, but uh, emerging chip support I2C and uh, SPI. There have been a reincoded rules for our packets up to 256 bytes. There are programming environment like uh, Java card, 6 billion devices uh, are uh, deployed every day, 6 billion Java cards. And uh, there are secure so software ma ma management, but something called global platform in order to list uh, the, the letter upload the software. Next slide, please. 
So why connecting secure element to internet? Uh, it's very simple. Uh, we want online uh, cryptographic resource for internet uh, users, and we want to identify these uh, resources by uh, uniform resource identifier. The issue, uh, there is no TCP IP stack in secure element, so we, we need additional uh, processor to manage uh, the networks. We need to support global platform for on-demand protocol. We need the de defined protocol to access secure element resources. We need, we need to define secure element naming, and we need to define attestation procedures for on-demand uh, application. For next slide, please. Uh, so there are mine is a free ITF draft in order to, to support this. One is called RAX, it's an old draft, and this draft is enabled to support a global platform over TLS. The second one is called, uh, second draft is called TLS SE for TLS for secure element. It supports uh, TLS PS key in uh, secure element. And uh, this gives a TLS interface to secure element, uh, which use a uh, TLS server name for uh, uniform resource identifiers. And the third draft is a station procedures. And it's, it's uh, in the Internet of Secure Element uh, IOSC draft. And uh, next slide, please. So at this moment, there are open software. Uh, one is TLS uh, SE for Java Card. It works with Java Card 3.04. Uh, it's available in uh, GitHub. And uh, the second open software is IOSC uh, version 5, which works with Windows, Ubuntu, and Raspberry Pi. And it is an implementation of RAX and TLS uh, from server. And it supports uh, multiple communication interface like PCSC, I2SIM, and uh, SIM array. And uh, that's it. I'm done. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, our next speaker will be Hannes, who is talking about attestation within uh, TLS. And I will find Hannes's slides real quick. Okay, uh, okay, you're on. Thank you, guys. Um, as mentioned, I want to talk about the new effort or new investigation we've been doing on uh, using attestation in DLS. Uh, next slide, Spencer. And as a short problem statement on why we are doing this, um, I'm sure you're following, you've been following the work on attestation and in the IETF and the RATS working group and some of the IoT work where we are trying to define mechanisms to enroll IoT devices into cloud-based services. And they typically want to see all sorts of information about whether the device is genuine, whether it has been cloned, um, what type of uh, configuration it's using during boot, what uh, software it's running on, et cetera. And all of this is covered in, in RADS with these uh, entity attestation token and other similar mechanisms. And then at the end of uh, the dance, once the device is authorized, it actually typically establishes a secure communication channel with the cloud-based service. And so next slide. Um, it was kind of obvious to combine the two steps of attestation with DLS, and that's what we have been doing in, in uh, a recently published document and also software we've been working on. The solution is simple to augment the DLS exchange with um, the attestation information and to provide a, a proof of possession. Um, the software we are working on, which we'll hopefully uh, will be able to release shortly, uses a combination of uh, MPET DLS with DLS 1.3, um, a platform agnostic uh, library to access security hardware called BASEC. Um, and on the cloud side, there is a verification services service we need to use, uh, which um, colleagues of mine have been working on called Verizon. And we basically munch all these uh, three components together to 
um, accomplish a, a workable system. Next slide. And here, here's the document and the uh, pointer to the projects we are using. And uh, soon you will also see the sort of this POC, uh, essentially, or the, the stack. And if someone is interested in the details or wants to collaborate or has similar type of attestation systems, uh, come and talk to me. Thank cool. you. Thank you. Next speaker is uh, Lynn Hahn, who will be talking about the LEO satellite networking, the flying infrastructure for future internet. Uh, let me find your slides. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my talk is uh, LEO satellite networking uh, infrastructure for future internet. Uh, this is a pretty big topic. I don't think five, four minutes is enough, but uh, I will try to do my best to give most important information. Next slide. Uh, LEO satellite is the uh, uh, most key uh, components in the uh, future non-terrestrial network integration. Uh, because it can provide the uh, shorter latency and the higher bandwidth compared with other satellites or other space uh, networking technology. And it can uh, provide the global coverage. Next slide. Uh, why LEO satellites are so special? Because it's a uh, movement, it uh, moving so fast. Uh, unfortunately, this is uh, originally a PPT has uh, some video clip. If you're interested, I can uh, give you, you can sh shoot me email. Uh, first is that 50% of satellites move into different di directions as another 50%. This, uh, as this will cause the satellite networking becoming an interleaved mesh network and moving at a very high speed. Also including the uh, self-rotation of Earth makes the uh, 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 movement is uh, even uh, more complicated. Second issue is that the link between satellite and the ground station will keep flipping about five minutes. And uh, the distance between satellite and the ground also keep changing. And uh, also the uh, combination is uh, point to multi point. And a huge number of satellite ground station link could be more than a million uh, links. Uh, last problem is that uh, IS RS distance between adjacent satellites is keep changing, and also those uh, uh, links will be uh, swapping the direction at the polar area. Next slide. So ITF has done a lot of work uh, for many years uh, for satellites, but unfortunately, uh, uh, most of our work are focusing on other layers. For example, we have done um, a DTN. Uh, it's uh, not fitting to LU. And uh, we have done L4 works, which is uh, about transportation layer. And uh, we have done the coding for the satellites. Uh, even we had a SETCOM site meeting in uh, old ITF. Uh, recently, we have uh, many uh, uh, satellite related draft come up, um, uh, but uh, long existing home for those uh, drafts. The first question we have to answer is that, uh, is the IP networking needed for LEO? Because many people challenge me, say uh, Starlink doesn't use it. That's true. But uh, we have many reasons to, to, to predict that the L3 technology is still best for the LEO satellite. First is the scalability. Uh, second is the interworking with the internet. And the third one is that uh, 3GPP has already expected that uh, uh, the satellite network is an uh, IP network. Uh, I have more material at the back of the slides. You can read it. Then uh, we, we have to figure out what is the problem for the current IP technology. Actually, there are many problems from addressing to routing uh, to traffic engineering and the multipass and even mobility. Uh, we may need to re reinvestigate and uh, enhance it. Uh, next slide. 
So what next? Uh, we plan to have a side meeting in next ITF, not this ITF, next ITF. So if you are interested, just reach me. And uh, uh, if you want to contribute or present something in the side meeting, just let me know. Thank you. Phil, this, 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 this is you, this is you. Let me bring you up your slides. Okay. Well, while he's bringing up the first slide, I'd like to really thank all the WebRTC folk. If it wasn't for the work that you'd done, the pandemic would have gone a lot worse. <laughs> that said, next slide, please. <laughs> If you look at the state of WebRTC today, this is what users are seeing. All that open standards-based goodness is hidden be behind a proprietary walled garden. Next. What, next slide, please. what users need is the ability to communicate with any other user, no matter which service provider is providing their WebRTC contact. And they should not just be able to choose a messaging provider and talk to everybody. They should be able to change their messaging provider at any time without switching costs. I'm a person. I am not your business model. We need messaging address portability. Oh, and telephone numbers. Who on earth thought of using telephone numbers for messaging on the internet. <laughs> Next slide. Oh, and yes, it'd be nice to have some security, not least because um, you know the potential sponsor I've got wants some security, and I'm a security guy. Next slide, please. The problem I see in the current end-to-end -end messaging model is that all we get is end-to-end -end security. We think about securing the packets as they're going from the sender to the receiver. But that doesn't close down all the points of vulnerability where a hostile government can do something hostile. Next slide. The problem is that unless you control your own contacts directory so that you control the knowledge of the public key of the other party, that's a place where a warrant can be imposed to redirect calls to another endpoint. So you've still got end-to-end -end security, you're just going to the wrong endpoint. <laughs> and the applications are another point. If you've got a sole vendor system in a walled garden, the, uh, a government can and does and has go to a vendor and say, you're going to put a back door in or we're going to shut you down. Next slide, please. Okay, so how do we fix it? Well, the first thing we need to do is to complete the messaging stack. And I've been looking at WebRTC, and you know, I've got this threshold key infrastructure that manages pub public and private keys people across devices and makes it really easy for the end user. It's transparent security. So what I want to do is to take my security stuff, my TKI, and bolt it on top of WebRTC. Uh, the user will control the contacts catalog. So that cannot be tampered with. And the user, because it will all be an open specification, the user can choose, hopefully, between multiple application providers, not just my uh, prototype. And that removes a single point of failure. Next slide. OK, so what I, I'm going to be here till Friday. Uh, if you're interested in uh, this type of project, uh, please talk to me. Uh, you know, tell me, you know, I'm not a WebRTC person. I can see how to do it. I've kind of sort of got my prototype running, and I'll be uh, hopefully running that prototype by uh, London. Uh, but I would really appreciate help on choosing the best path, path through WebRTC and the best of breed thing to uh, go to market with. So thank you for your time. and. Uh, mathmesh.com has the further details. Thank you.
So next speaker is uh, Lijun Dong, uh, who's talking about challenges in operations and control networks. I will find your slides. Um, hi, uh, my name is Li Jun Dong. I'm going to present on this operations and control networks. Um, through this presentation, I mainly want to call for your participation in the side meeting we're going to host on OCN tomorrow lunchtime. Next slide. Um, as you know, automation grows and becomes more dynamic. Uh, the factory floors will require more sophisticated controllers with more processing time, uh, more processing capabilities, um, more flexibility and more interoperability um, uh, support. And the controllers sitting in the cloud, um, such as virtualized PRCs, uh, would uh, become more and more popular. As another use case in remote driving, um, a remote uh, human driver actually controls or operates a vehicle from a distance through communication networks. And the remote driving is um, extremely useful when autonomous driving becomes you know, short or forced short and in some hazardous environment where human cannot access. So such um, factory automation or remote driving use cases do require network to guarantee the latent end-to-end -end latency and also need to ad identify what are the urgent, uh, most urgent packets and treat them with some more priority and avoid them being dropped during transmission. Um, so those different vertical, like industry vertical, do share some common operation of uh, behavioral op operations in control systems. So there is a controller which interfaces with the sensors to collect data and then interfaces with the accurator to send a command. Um, but if those end devices are networked, there would, some, would have some issues. So um, those common elements or abstract elements uh, by using OCN actually enable us to um, have discussions on those requirements and issues. Next slide, please. So we define OSIN as operation, uh, like it's a short name for operation and control network. It's an interconnection of a few devices uh, and their controllers for the exchange of data to cause and monitor chains to the ad, uh, end equipment. Next slide, please. So what are the issues we want to consider in OCN? Um, so with the controllers uh, being sitting in the cloud and there are more and more uh, field devices being deployed, maybe it is time to explore the opportunities and the methods to use IP to interconnect the controllers and uh, field devices and to build OCN. And high precision communication are needed because you want to guarantee the key performances and to provide a more granular uh, QoS to build OCN. And you know, there are multiple types of, um, you know, like uh, uh, media such as, uh, you know, 5G radio, uh, Ethernet, you know, the, all those uh, kind of uh, different um, media and as well as there are multiple types of field bus communication protocols. We want to use OCN to convert them in a large scale. Uh, with some reference model. Um, and then addressing uh, needs to be supported like, you know, auto configuration and also heterogeneous addressing. Um, and we also need to uh, build the message types. Um, for, for example, what are common characteristics between the controllers and the field devices? And the last but not least is the security you know we want to ensure the security of communication uh, between the field devices and the controllers um and next slide please all right uh so we are going to host this side meeting on OCN tomorrow lunch time uh, in room actually this is the wrong slide we are going to host a side meeting <laughs> Horizon at rooftop level, okay? And this is the website, oh, web link we can share. And 
I guess I did a better job. Yes. Now, yeah, yeah, yeah. Most importantly, come to the side meeting. I was, I was, I was just going to let her put up the sound check slide for the meeting guests. Um, next, next speaker is uh, Arnaud, who is talking about enterprises and organizations needing help from ECH work on how to organize their operational security. And you, Hi there. Uh, can Arnaud, you hear me? You are remote. Yes, absolutely. Okay, we can hear you. you. We can hear you fine. And uh, let me find your slides. Thank you, Spencer. So good, uh, good evening, I guess, for you guys. I'm sorry for my voice. I have a bad COVID, so <clears throat> hopefully not cough too much. All right. So this is um, uh, we prepared a paper on ECH for enterprises. Uh, it's not a critique of ECH. We are trying to look beyond. And the situation is pretty simple. Enterprises are facing a set of requirements and constraints, uh, compliance, risk, threat landscape. And since 30 years, they evolved the defense and operational security from the old X.800 to Zero Trust to SSE to Mesh, etc. And they need to the, the kind of the need for network security controls and selective decrypt, for example, with uh, uh, for data loss prevention. So if we remove the access to the SNI, uh, ECH is pushing security to the endpoints. Now, unfortunately, in the paper, we show we can not trust the device and not trust the browser. We found enough evidence of man in the browser attacks. And worse, if you really want to protect the people, you not only need to access the SNI, but you need to read the entire, the entire page. That's the only way to detect the attack. So the browser cannot be judge and party, which means how are we going to do security? So, or perhaps ECH is pushing a security model that goes in the cloud facing server. So that would make the cloud facing server a middle box. Is it an opportunity actually to find a solution between the different parties? And that's really the question we are trying to address. Next slide. So it's pretty simple. Uh, we need first a clarification on the cloud facing server, so the backend server. Is it really left to just implementation or do we need the protocol uh, based uh, for the cloud facing server to the backend server? Um, in this case, we are back to middle box problem. If ECH constitutes cannot be judge and parties, how do we integrate a third party security component? And is there a form of recognition and management of, of enterprise operational security problems? Both answers can happen and they will lead to different developments. So if you are interested to find a way forward here, uh, please join. In fact, I made a mistake. It's not 1.30 p.m. It will be noon 30. Uh, PM uh, on Tuesday, and you can contact me. Thank you. Thank you. And our next speaker is uh, Gusama, who is talking about uh, a data driven approach to tackle network diversity with heterogeneous protocol configurations. And let me find the let me let me let me find your slides. Hi, Spencer. So yeah, all right. Uh, I am a graduate student at Brown University, and I, today I wanted to share some research work with the broader IETF community to see if everyone's, anyone is interested. So uh, next slide, please. So websites typically use CDNs uh, to deliver their content efficiently to the end users, and uh, they have this cluster of servers spread across, across the globe, uh, typically called CDN Edge. And at the edge, we have protocols like TCP and HTTP that dictate the data transmission rules. So there's multiple options available. We have multiple types of HTTP and different HTTP configuration. And similarly for TCP, we have 
different congestion controls like BBR, Cubic, Reno, and multiple other options such as congestion windows. And it's the job of operator to select the configuration that are expected to maximize the performance. Traditionally, the operator selects one set of configuration, which are then uh, homogeneously used for the entire user base. And in this work, we, we asked this question that is this approach uh, really optimal? So can you go to the next slide, please? So in fact, we, when we look at the client tier or the user base, we see that there's a diversity there. Uh, users come from different regions, have different last mile connections like 2D, 3G, 4G. Uh, and it's a problem because uh, the performance of the protocols is sensitive to the type of network and devices. So assuming that uh, as an edge has three users, uh, one with low latency, one with uh, high bandwidth, and one with high loss uh, network parts, the choice of optimal configuration can be very different based on the type of network. And uh, in fact, uh, we did some measurements at scale that actually showed that there's a tremendous opportunity here. There's an opportunity to improve uh, web performance. Uh, and the figure here shows the improvement in page load time for websites. And there's up to 70% improvement at tail if we are using uh, some sort of an oracle to uh, configure the right configuration on a per connection basis. So next slide, please. So in this work, uh, we propose a system that optimizes web performance by systematically reconfiguring the network networking stack. So basically taking into features such as a user's network, uh, the device and website, uh, our system selects, uh, uh, predicts the right set of configuration that should be uh, expected to maximize the performance. Next slide, please. So we propose uh, two changes to the existing uh, CDN architecture. Uh, we first propose a data path component that runs at a server level. And it, uh, it, it is basically a modification of the today's networking stack and it allows a flexible reconfiguration so that we can tune things like TCP condition control or HTTP on a per connection basis. And the second component is a global control path uh, that uses some algorithmic and some machine learning magic to try to predict the right set of configuration that, that can be used. So basically this, uh, this runs in a data-driven sort of model. Uh, it ingests data uh, from the servers and uh, models the performance of different configurations. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so in this work, uh, we asked this question that uh, since it's hard to make uh, or design protocols that are generalizable across different types of networks and devices, Perhaps it's, this is the right time where we should invest and design systems uh, that can make that uh, our networking stack architecture more flexible so that our networking stack can dynamically adapt to what the users have on their end. So if you are interested in learning more about it, please uh, reach out to me or my advisor, Theo Benson, or you can take a look at our NSDI paper. Uh, I'll be also in Philadelphia from tomorrow. And uh, if you want to talk, talk more about it, we can definitely do that. Thanks. Thank you. Um, yes. Next, we have Jake talking about multicast quick. I will find your slides. All right. Thanks. You can probably just go to the next one right away. I'm, I'm Jake, and I'm talking about multicast quick. Um, and uh, yeah, next slide. Uh, the basic premise, uh, there's a draft. Go ahead and read it. Um, the basic premise here is that uh, unicast is a real problem. I've been working on this for a while. I've been talking to a lot of ISPs, uh, got some ideas about how to get them to transport it. But then the next step is what are we going to transport? Next slide, please. Um, and uh, the basic idea is IP multicast is what we want to use. Um, so we proposed a way to uh, trans to to let Quick use that. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so just I'm not going to go over the whole thing, of course. Um, read the draft, but uh, the the basic idea is you're still going to have a single unicast connection between any two endpoints. You're going to be the server is going to tell the client, "Hey, join these channels." Um, the client's going to be sending acts, uh, so the server knows what channels it got, what what data it's getting from these channels, and um, 
uh, and the multicast is going to be used for a server to client only. So this matches up with the security consideration stack that we presented in SEC Dispatch in 112, we think. And uh, we are looking to uh, get a prototype running. Um, next slide, please. So uh, I just wanted to let people know about it. I'll be talking about this a little bit more in the quick working group on Thursday. Um, we've got, uh, you know, we've got the draft. We'd love to get feedback on it. Anybody who wants to review. Um, we've been working on an implementation with the uh, W3C multicast community group. Uh, if you're interested, you can join us there and uh, contribute to that. Uh, my email is there. You can ping me and uh, please come to quick and or find me anytime this week and give me comments and I'd love to have them. Uh, or my co-author Max here, raise your hand. Anybody can find either of us and we will uh, take all your feedback and do what we can with it. Thank you very much. Uh, last speaker will be Stuart Cheshire, who will be talking about network latency, why it matters, how to measure it, and what to do about it. And I will find your slides in just a second. Okay. Perfect. No, that's not no, it. That's not you. Uh, I will. I will now go find the next slide, which is actually the right slides. I think I just clicked on the wrong one. Sorry. Mm -hmm. I don't know why that keeps jumping down, but it did. All right, ah, that's better. Okay, excellent. Uh, my name is Stuart Chersha, and for the last four minutes today, I'm going to talk a little bit about latency. Let's move on. We're all very used to thinking about performance in terms of throughput. Everybody knows how many megabits the home internet connection is, and that's good for big downloads. But for everything else that we do for maps, driving directions, weather forecasts. Every time you're sitting watching an app with some little spinny wheel, waiting, 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 it's not because you don't have enough bandwidth. It's because you have too much delay. This affects lots of things that are very obvious, like online gaming, video conferencing. It affects many other things. Even if you're watching a two-hour streaming video, if you want to skip to another chapter, then suddenly it's the latency that affects the performance of that. Okay, next, please. Last year, some of my colleagues at Apple put out a new measurement tool. The instructions for how to enable it are at this link, which is in the PDF on the website. And when you enable that, if you tap on the I button, then, yep, next, please. Then you see uh, a button for diagnostics, and when you tap on that, it will show you the responsiveness of your network. Uh, we present this in round trips per minute because most people like metrics where more is better, and milliseconds <laughs> is a fairly abstract concept to a lot of people, even for us in this room. How much is a millisecond? Well, it's too small to notice. Does it really matter? So we wanted a number that is more uh, people relate to more easily. Next, please. Since last year, Waveform has put out a really good buffer bloat test. Professor William Hawkins from University of Cincinnati has got an open source implementation in Go. And uh, more recently, uh, Ookla, makers of probably the most popular speed test app and website on the internet, have added a measure of working latency. So if you're not staying in the IETF hotel, when you get back to your hotel tonight, try out the Ookla speed test on your hotel. Uh, try it on your mobile phone on LTE and 5G. Try it at home, try it at work. You may be very shocked by the results. 
Until now, speed tests have told you the idle latency in milliseconds, but that tells you how well your network works when no one is using it. That's not very useful. What we want to know is how well your network works when it is being used, and speed test will now report this. So we know there's a problem. What are we going to do about it? The answer, in my opinion, is L4S. It's a new method of doing congestion control in partnership between the endpoints and the network. It's called low latency, low loss, scalable throughput. And I can't explain all of this in one slide, but the summary is it works to keep Q short. By keeping Q short, we keep round trip delays short. As soon as a queue starts to build up at the bottleneck link, it uses ECN marks to tell the sender to slow down. Next one, please. We had a lot of representation at the hackathon. Let's move through these pictures quickly. Go ahead, next, please. Uh, we had two CMTS racks set up. Next. <laughs> we had, we took over a big chunk. Go on, next one, please. We took over a big chunk of the hackathon room. Uh, next couple of slides, please. We had a whole bunch of equipment piled up on desks, a uh, lot of energy. So uh, to learn more, there's a great BITAG report. If people ask you about latency and you don't want to spend an hour explaining it yourself, point them to this report. If you prefer video, there's an Apple developer conference presentation about 15 minutes long by my colleague, Vidi Goyle, who's here today. And last slide, please come to, can you go to the last slide, please? Can you put up the last slide? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, come and see us on Monday, and come on Friday if you're interested in the measurement. Thank you. Thank you. And let's give a, yes, the, the actual applause for, for Stuart, and then let's give a round of applause for all of our speakers today. Thank you all for coming, uh, and thank you for your patience as I figured out what I was doing, which, yeah. Um, and uh, enjoy your ITF, and do the right thing. Bye-bye.